immediately goes into the fixing thing, it starts telling you everything that you need to know, and that's, that's really more of a sign that that person actually isn't the safe, loving person because they're probably acting out of their own stuff. They're trying to solve your problems in ways that they solve their problems, and that might work, that might not. But someone who's genuinely attuned, that has the patience and the presence to sit and listen, to be with, is going to uh, be able to move through that with you. The thing that heals in that witnessing stage isn't getting back into the trauma. It's being with the traumatic memory. That's a Frank Anderson line. It's not being in, it's with. And the way that you and I stay with our own suffering is in relationship. Okay? So you have to have an experiential and relational encounter with the truth, the truth of your subjective experience and the truth as reflected in the eyes of someone who loves you. Then, and this is really important, there needs to be a release of the burden. Relational wounds impart burden. The burden can be a label. It could be, uh, I'm worthless. I don't belong. It could be, uh, I deserved it. I brought it on myself. It could be that I'm just not interesting enough. Right? It can be. It could be more of a bodily thing. It could just be the general feeling of unsafety. The general feeling that I'm about to die. I could die at any moment. Something could come around the corner and I would just be toast. It can be a sensation, right? Thoughts, feelings, sensations. So there's some sort of burden that's imposed. Some of that's cognitive, some of that's in the body. And that needs to be released. Part of that is going to be dislodged with the truth, right? So in that moment of sharing the truth, when the truth emerges, the truth can look like reframing a label. What? You're not worthless. You belong. You're not pathetic. You're strong. You're not pointless. You have meaning, right? So there's a replacement of the label. It could also be what should have happened in a moment that didn't happen. That's very common with neglect. When you're working with neglect, there's not this big traumatic memory. There's not this big thing. For me, it was like the emotional neglect from my dad that was most pervasive. It's not like my dad, you know, abused me in some way. It was that he just wasn't present, and he should have been present. Part of my healing was listing out, and I did this in the context of prayer, but listing out every single thing that I needed from him. When I was in sixth grade and this happened, I needed you to do what? I needed you to do this. When I was in eighth grade and this happened, I needed this from you. When I was in college and I didn't know what to do, I needed you to give me guidance. When I was getting married and I was really nervous, I needed you to give me insight. When I was this, when I was this, when I was this, I needed blank, I needed blank. And then part of my own journey in that was to see how God provided incredible men and mentors and friends in my life that filled and satiated each of those needs. That when I was in college and didn't know what to do, I had a professor that was incredibly kind and took me under his wing in a really personal way. And he gave me that guidance that I needed. And part of the truth that, and this is just my experience, but part of the truth for me was my dad let me down and I survived. My dad wasn't there, and I'm okay. He left me lonely, and I was comforted. He, uh, he left me without insight, and insight came. And as I'm standing today, I have what I need for right now. I don't have maybe everything I desire. <laughs> I don't have, there's not like a completion thing. I'm not saying there's, this, there's like, everything's perfect. I'm, but for what I need, I have it. That was part of the truth that was revealed to me in my relational encounter with the truth. Hmm. When the truth actually arrives, that's where forgiveness is tenable. It actually stands as a reasonable option because you fixed the car. And so it's, it's like when you're hanging out with someone who owes you money, it's really awkward. <laughs> but if you're hanging out with someone and you don't, have that hanging over your head, then the emotional tension isn't there because you're not holding your side of the tension. And that's a Steve Hayes analogy. It's so brilliant. It's like 
you, you feel like you're in this tension with mom and dad, let's say it's over boundaries or something, like you really don't want your mom to criticize you, you're trying to set up this boundary. You're like, mom, if you criticize me, I'm gonna leave, and then you don't, because you know she gets critical again at your meal, and you don't get up, and then you feel bad later, you're like, ah, oh, I didn't hold to my boundary, she's not respecting my boundary. My theory is that most of our boundary issues are rooted in resentment. Because I'm still waiting for you to fill in the emotional gap on what you owe me. Mom, you should have nurtured me, you should have been this, you should have been more encouraging, and I'm still waiting on you to provide that. And so how am I supposed to set a boundary and like get up and leave when I'm still hungry for that? When I still need that nurture, how am I supposed to set up a wall and cut it off? And some of you might be sitting here, you have people in your life you've been struggling with boundaries with, and that's never occurred to you that, whether it's about them or maybe it's a resentment regarding something else and that you're projecting something else kind of onto this relationship. That your boundary issues, maybe that's, that, maybe that's resentment you hold towards your son or your daughter. Might be related in something that you and you that isn't healed. And so if you heal that wound, it frees you up. The Steve Hayes analogy I was referencing is like when you're in this tension, you're pulling back and forth over a boundary. If you drop the rope, no more tension. And then it's like, how am I supposed to not care about the rope? You have to care about it in a different way. The way you're caring about it now is keeping you stuck. Is there a different way to care about that rope that you haven't explored? Forgiveness naturally emerges in the environment of the heart that's healed. For me, that was learning that, okay, just because I forgive somebody doesn't necessarily mean I trust them. In the same way that you shouldn't own me your car again. <laughs> you know, and you could say, well, I'm a forgiving person, you know? And, if, if, if I don't loan Matthias the car, it means I'm not, I haven't really forgiven him. Do you, do you see how absurd that is now? It's like, well, no, it has nothing to do with it. The, the forgiveness had to do with the damage. And you did that. You had to heal that. But you shouldn't loan me your car. That would be foolish. And so there's three ways that we renegotiate relationships after forgiveness. Forgiveness, again, is healing the car, right? It's healing the emotional damage. Or I should say it's the warmth that comes from healing that emotional damage. And that warmth, that's tricky. I don't have a good word for this. Maybe after, I'll be standing there if you want to talk, but give me a better word for this. I need to figure this out. It's something like, the environment is something like warm pity. And I know pity is a weird word because we kind of think of that as some superiority complex. It's not really what I mean, but it's not quite compassion. Compassion says like, I want to get in and help. And I don't think that's it. I think that when you're renegotiating relationship with someone who's hurt you, it's appropriate and actually wise to be like, okay, it's not my thing. I don't have to fix mom. I don't have to fix dad. She's going through her own stuff. They need to actually fix their own car. I don't have to get within proximity of that battleground. If bombs are going off, I don't have to suffer from that. But that doesn't mean I'm like resentful. It doesn't mean I'm holding them. Like I've healed that. And it's in this disposition, and maybe I've felt this in my own heart, and I need to figure this part out. It's like, pity but warm. It's like, I see your suffering and I hate that. I don't want you to suffer. I don't want anyone to suffer. And I feel warm towards you, like, but, I, but I'm not going to take it as my responsibility to step in and resolve it. So there's a disposition of warm pity that allows us to renegotiate. Do I cut off the relationship? Do I limit the relationship? Or do I restore the relationship, right? Not easy to navigate. When you're in a state of forgiveness, you're sober to negotiate that. If you're in resentment, you're gonna run against a brick wall, the brick wall of your own anger, over and over. And uh, you're gonna wanna punish. You're gonna wanna be vengeful. And that is a capacity in all of our hearts. And I know I'm talking to a bunch of warm, empathetic, you know, folks in the helping field, but I know you, because <laughs> I know myself. And there's anger there, there's bitterness, there's envy. And if that's animating your boundaries, you're gonna run into a wall over and over. 
So it's in that state of healing, in that state of forgiveness, we renegotiate the relationship. With my dad, it's a limited relationship right now, I'll be honest with you. There's a degree of intimacy and we're building back trust. Um, a curiosity that I'm trying to extend to get to know who he is now. Because he's not who I thought I was, but that doesn't mean I want to reject that. I'm, okay, there's a whole new domain to my dad that I didn't know. There's a whole dimension of his experience that he's exploring right now in a way that deeply grieves me and I want to press into and explore. 